So I'm going to show uh, two applications of DAS. Um, most of this work actually started in GeoAzul and I'm uh, continuing to work on it now. I'm going to show you, show you examples of how we can use DAS for subsurface imaging, something that we did um, it, at Greece in a shadow sedimentary basin. And I'm going to show you initial results for uh, earthquake early warning applications to DAS. And this work was done with many researchers here, the entire DAS team, um, miss you guys. So the outline of the talk, I'm going to um, briefly summarize the main principles of DAS. What are the measurements that we, that we can get from these uh, optical fibers? And then the talk is divided into two. I'm going to spend most of it talking about subsurface imaging and then show a few results for earthquake early warning. Distributed acoustic sensing or DAS allows us to turn optical fibers, basically any optical fiber that's deployed either for telecommunication purposes, for seismology, any fiber can be used into large N arrays of seismic sensors. Um, it allows us to obtain measurements every few meters along tens of kilometers long of fibers. So this is an example of one fiber used offshore Toulon. The interrogator is placed at one end of the fiber. In this case, the fiber goes to the ocean bottom to a depth of two and a half kilometers. So it's very hard to get seismic measurements with standard uh, ocean bottom seismometers at these locations. But if we can use existing fibers, it becomes very easy. Uh, in principle, we connect the interrogator to the optical fiber. And this machine includes a laser source, a computer, and data storage. This interrogator introduces uh, light into the fiber, laser pulses and it analyzes the backscattered light. Now, the reason that we have backscattering is because the fiber itself consists of many anomalies, many density and imperfections that cause that interact with the in, incoming photons. Some of the light is then backscattered to the interrogator. Now, when a seismic wavefront sweeps across the fiber, and this can be any type of acoustic wavefront, it causes to, the fiber to slightly compress or stretch. And these small variations actually changes the structure of the heterogeneity is inside the fiber. They change the backscattered pattern that is recorded by the interrogator. And the interrogator knows how to compute the phase differences between consecutive samples at a specific location along the fiber and deduce the um, strain that was introduced to the fiber. So with this technology, as I said, we are able to obtain these strain or strain rate measurement time series every few meters along tens of kilometers, even more than 100 kilometer long fibers. The applications are almost endless. We already saw with many papers that we can monitor or record earthquakes using dust. We can image subsurface structures, and I'm going to show this uh, figure later on. We can track ocean bottom currents, something that uh, Daniel Mata is working on. We can track boats, paper that the end recently published, we can track cars, something that Martin is also working on. Uh, we can see the calling of whales. And something that's becoming increasingly more uh, frequent in the industry, we can monitor structures, gas line, pipelines, um, intrusion alerts, thus as many applications in the industry as well. So one of the reasons that we are so interested in harnessing this technology for seismology is because we have a very significant observational bias most of our seismic instruments are located on land. Most of our measurements are obtained with seismometers. And it's very expensive to place them underwater. But if we are able to use this very extensive network of uh, ocean bottom fibers for seismology, we would essentially augment and fill this observational gap. And here we can see some of these fibers deployed offshore Chile that the DN recently used for measurements as part of the uh, ERC projects. And I'm sure we'll get very interesting results from these. Uh, this experiment. Also, also on land, we have a very extensive deployment of optical fibers, and this can be used to, to further densify existing seismic networks. Even in Japan, where the seismic network is very dense, the spacing between the different seismometers is between uh, 15 to 20 kilometers. If we are able to harness at least some of these fibers for seismology, we would significantly densify the networks and be able to do very um, interesting things, some of which I'm going to talk about, such as uh, subsurface imaging, 
but this could be also very beneficial for earthquake early warning and hazard mitigation purposes. So subsurface imaging. Previous studies already um, showed that we can use ambient noise recorded with dark fibers to image the subsurface structure between, uh, beneath them. This is an example from Japan, another example from uh, Monterey, offshore California. The main differences between what they did and what I'm going to show is the scale of the problem. This fiber was very long. You can see here that it's almost 50 kilometers long. This fiber was also very long, around <clears throat> 40 kilometers. When we use such long fibers, they were not really concerned about the resolution of the fine structures that the fiber can detect. We, on the other hand, used a very short stretch of fiber. We can see it here only two and a half kilometers. So this place is located at the southern west tip of Greece, offshore a small village called Metoni. This is a small enclosed bay that has also a um, sedimentary basin inside the bay. The fiber here, as you can see, is not very deep. It goes to a water depth of around 20 meters. And as I said before, it's only two and a half kilometers long. When we look at the bathymetry, we can see that the bathymetry uh, slowly decreases towards the deeper section of the basin. And then it increases again and exits the bay to the west. The fiber itself that you can see here goes uh, to the East Ionian Sea, very deep in the Mediterranean, it goes as deep as four kilometers. Um, but I'm only going to focus on the first two and a half kilometers for this study. We don't have a lot of ground truth. We don't really know. Um, what's going on here underwater. Not many seismological or geophysical studies done in this region. We mostly rely on these types of uh, geological maps. Um, from this map, we can understand that these uh, formations are limestone and they extend over here, uh, covering the west edge of the basin. We can see them here as well. We have softer flish formations on the eastern edge of the basin. And this delta is covered by alluvium, softer sediments, uh, sand, gravel. And having known the tectonic setting of the region, we can assume that underneath the, the bay, we have limestone formations overlain with flish formations. We can see that flish is also um, covering this island in the middle of the bay. And on top, we have softer sediments that arrive from this delta. But um, but overall, we don't really know what's going on beneath the bay, and we don't have strong ground truth to compare our model to. Now, the reason we are interested not specifically in this bay, but specific, but over, generally in sedimentary basins, is that they are known to amplify ground motions. And this is something that can be very significant during earthquakes. Here we have an earthquake record. We see the direct S arrival recorded inside the basin. We see waves reflected from the edges of the basin. We see here interactions between the different waves arriving from the both edges and very complex uh, interactions between the two wave fields. When we zoom out, we see very um, significant amplification inside the basin. While when we just look outside the basin, we have very uh, low amplitude strains. When we look at earthquakes, at the spectral ratio between earthquakes recorded inside the basin and outside the basin, we can see that inside we have very significant low frequency amplification up to a factor of 10 when we compare it to earthquakes recorded outside the basin. And at the same time, we have high frequency attenuation. And this is something that's very typical of sedimentary basin of low velocity sediments. Um, waves are trapped inside the basin, low frequencies are amplified, and higher frequencies are attenuated because we have, again, low velocities and a large amount of scatters. Another thing that's uh, different when we look at dust data is that we don't record ground motions like we do with seismometers. We record strains. And strains are specifically um, very sensitive to the velocity of the media. So if the velocity here is very low, strains will be very high. And if the velocities here are very low, so if velocities are very high, strains will be very low. So we can also use this information to emphasize the amplification or deamplification 
that we see along the fiber. And this is something that's well known all around the world. We have an example from the uh, Mexico City 2017 earthquake. This is uh, um, a very good example to demonstrate how these basins amplify ground motions and how damaging they can be. The epicenter was located here around 400 kilometers from the city. The city is built on top of a sedimentary basin. And we can see that ground motions, ground accelerations recorded near the epicenter are very similar to those recorded inside the basin. You can see the numbers here, 150 centimeter per second square and 170 centimeter per second square. And the reason that we have such significant amplification in the city is because we have this sedimentary basin. So this is an example of some of the destruction caused by this earthquake, but the same phenomena occurs in other places around the world, such as uh, Kathmandu in 2015. The city is also built inside a sedimentary basin. Sichuan, 2008, and Izmir, 2020. And this earthquake actually occurred closer to Greece, but because structures here are built on soft sediments, they experienced strong ground shaking and much, uh, a lot of damage occurred to the city during this earthquake. To study uh, sedimentary basins, uh, several previous studies performed numerical simulations, and these are three different papers all arriving at pretty much the same result. When we look at the time domain, we see a plane wave that's introduced into um, a simple model, bowl shape model. We have reflections from the edges of the basin, similar to what we saw before with the earthquake that we recorded. The same can be seen here, reflections from the edges of the basin that go back and forth from the edges, and we can see the dispersion of the waves here. When we look at the frequency domain representation, what we get is actually an amplification map. We have frequency as a function of distance along the fiber. The color code here signifies the amount of amplification. And this um, indicative pattern, a bowl-shaped pattern, is often observed for sedimentary basins. So far, only for simulations, we um, managed to uh, recover such an image using dust observations. And this is the first time that such observations have been made using real world data. But the way to look at these maps is we have um, amplification, de frequency dependent amplification at a specific location along the model or, or along the fiber. And at a specific frequency, this um, a structure at this frequency will arrive at resonance during an earthquake. And this is a very useful tool to estimate the damage potential of earthquakes inside sedimentary basins. We have two different types of waves inside the basin. We used um, only the first type to image the structure beneath the, beneath the fiber. We have Schultz waves, which are similar to Rayleigh waves, only the Schultz waves propagate underwater. We see them here at one to five hertz, and they are strongly correlated with the subsurface structure. Here we have them uh, in the time domain, just 30 seconds. We have distance along the fiber as a function of time. Another type of waves, surface gravity waves, at uh, much lower frequencies, 0 to, uh, sorry, 0 0.01 hertz to 0.25 hertz. Uh, and their frequencies are significantly affected by the depth of the water column. On the right, we have FK plots. And FK is a 2D Fourier transform that decomposes the signal into temporal frequency and spatial frequency. So on the vertical, we have temporal frequency. And on the horizontal, we have the spatial frequency. Now, you can see here that we have positive spatial frequencies and negative spatial frequencies. Positive frequencies correspond to waves traveling towards the coast. And we can see that for the surface gravity waves, this is the most dominant branch. Negative spatial frequencies correspond to waves traveling from the coast to the sea. When we look at the short waves, we see that both branches are active. We have waves traveling both towards the interrogator and away from it. And we have a very rich and complex um, wave field that is recorded by our, uh, by our fiber optic. Um, here we use just five days of recording to image the basin. So we took the standard multi-channel analysis of surface wave approach. Um, the main framework is demonstrated in this uh, slide. So we take ambient noise, you see here distance along the fiber as a function of time. We calculate 
cross correlations and stack it for many days, in this case, just five. Here we have distance along the fiber as a function of offset, and we see the coherent part of the seismic wave field. We can calculate the FK transform. And here we can see the two dispersion curves for the fundamental mode and the first higher mode. And then we can take these two dispersion curves and invert for the 1D um, velocity model. So here we have the phase velocity as a function of frequency. We see the fundamental and the first higher modes. And we can run an inversion that um, finds the best velocity model. We have that as a function of sheet wave velocity. So we find the best model that corresponds to the observed dispersion curve. We ran the model 10 times, and we can see here 10 different red curves that correspond to the, two, to the 10 different uh, results. We have a good agreement between the 10 different runs, except for the bottom half space, the velocity of the bottom half space. And I'm going to explain in the next slide why that happens and what we can do with that. When we run the same procedure for different sections of fiber and apply some smoothing, we can um, derive a 2D velocity model. So we have depth as a function of the channel along the fiber. This is the shoreline. And this is the uh, seaward edge of the basin. Different colors correspond to the different velocities. We can see a very significant velocity contrast between the bottom half space and the overlying layers. And I'm going to, um, in the next slide, say how we got this number. Um, but something that's missing here are the edges of the basin. We don't see clear edges for the basin. And this is the next thing that I'm going to talk about. But we do see a low velocity zone here. So because we have big scatter for the um, velocities of the bottom half space, we use two on-land stations that are located on the limestone formations. And we can quite safely assume that the velocity of these limestone formations is equivalent to the velocity that's found beneath the soft sediments in the basin. So we took these two stations, calculated cross correlations at different frequency bands. And here we plot the normalized cross correlation as a function of the time shift. We did it for the north component and the vertical component. The north is in red, the vertical is in blue. The solid lines correspond to the envelope. The, that, sorry, is the vertical lines, the vertical black lines are zero. And the offsets that are indicated by the maximum envelope are shown here by the dashed uh, lines. And we have consistent shifts for the different frequency bands. From the shift and the distance between the two stations, we can obtain an estimate of the Rayleigh wave velocity between the stations. And then we can get an estimate of the Xi wave velocity. We can say that the Rayleigh wave velocity divided by 0.92 is um, the Xi wave velocity. And this provides us with some estimate of the velocity at the bottom of the basin. Now, regarding the edges of the basin, we have a problem with the, with the assumptions that go into this analysis, to the analysis that's based on dispersion curves. Now, when we calculate the cross correlations, we do it on a specific cable segment. In this case, this segment is between channel 17 and 47. And this is located here. Some of it is outside the basin and it extends all the way here. Now, when we calculate cross correlations on this relatively short section, but we do have, we do expect to see lateral variations within it. When you calculate it, when you calculate the cross correlations, we assume that the resulting 1D velocity model is an average of whatever is happening here. When we look at the cross correlations, we see waves reflected from the edges of the basin. So we do expect to see some clear impedance contrast, some clear edge to the basin. But because of the assumptions of the method, the method neglects significant lateral variations, we are only left with an average velocity model. And this becomes very problematic when we approach the edges of the basin. We only see the wave field inside the basin all the estimates are biased, and we are not able to reliably resolve the edges. So we um, added a scale-independent approach. 
And to this end, we calculated power spectral densities and autocorrelation. Now, the main advantage of these two measures is that they are uh, very objective. Uh, the calculation is relatively simple and straightforward. We as an operator do not have to make any decisions about how to pick the dispersion curves, how to pick the, the segment of cable that we're doing the analysis for. Basically, everybody that does this analysis will come up with the same results. And if we give different, uh, if we give the same data to different seismologists and ask them to derive a 2D velocity model, each one of them will give us different results. So these observations are, must, are much more uh, reliable than the 2D velocity model. So let's take a moment to see what we have here. Um, we see frequency as a function of the channel along the fiber. And here we have images that are very similar to those recreated with simulations. This is the first time that such a detailed amplification image was obtained with, uh, with observations, specifically with dust, but with the seismic observations in general. We see frequency increases at the edges of the basin, which are indicative of basin edges. We see them at both sides of the basin. We also see frequency amplification, frequency increases, sorry, at the center of the basin. This is not, uh, it's not that easy to see them, but they are here. When we look at the autocorrelations, we see same, the same features with a different expression. We have reflections from the edges of the basin, which you can see here. And we also have this indicative triangular shape at the middle of the basin. And this is something that's observed often for uh, fracture zones or other low velocity regions that act as a waveguide. Now, because the PSD is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelations, we basically see the same data at both plots, only with a different representation. So the fact that we see this triangular shape here says that there is some manifestation of it here. So let's summarize the observations. We have the 2D velocity model. We have the PSD. We have the autocorrelations. And we also have the first five seconds of the S wave for a specific earthquake recorded by the fiber. Now we can compare the earthquake record to the autocorrelations because we can assume that the earthquake is very small. This was a magnitude 3.7. The source acts as a delta function. And we can safely assume that what we see here is very closely related to the uh, Green's function, what we see with the autocorrelations. So we don't really see edges at the velocity model. We do see the low velocity zone in the middle. For the PSD, we said that we do see the edges, the frequency increases, and we slightly see frequency increases at the center of the basin. And for the autocorrelations and earthquake record, we see reflections from the edges of the basin with the same velocity. This red line is the same for the different plots. And we do see the triangular shape at the center of the basin. Now, we wanted to use the insight that we obtained using these three panels to modify the velocity model and then to verify that we did modify the velocity model correctly, we ran numerical simulations and then compared the observations with the simulated uh, waveforms. So the way that we modified the model, first of all, uh, we smoothed the interfaces between the different layers. We artificially created edges of the basin. And each layer here now has a uniform velocity that is the average of the different layers in the first model. Now, we, our aim here is to only um, qualitatively reproduce the observations. If you wanted to accurately reproduce them, these basin edges would have to be somewhat different. And this is um, an inversion procedure that is not uh, within the scope of this work, but it's something that can be done in future studies. So we ran, um, simulated SV plane wave with a two hertz weaker wavelet, only 60 seconds of simulations, a DT of three milliseconds, a DX of 20 meters. Um, we simulated ground velocities. We then differentiated them to strain rates and then calculated PSD and autocorrelations. So just to say one word about the transition between ground velocities and strain rates. So strain rate, as I said before, is very sensitive to the uh, local velocity 
the local velocity is usually expressed as the apparent velocity of the waves. We can see here that waves with very high apparent velocity, very fast waves, almost don't exist when we go from ground motions to strains. On the other hand, very slow waves like the one that we see here, it's kind of hard to see it here. But when we go to strain rates, the low velocity causes this wave to be amplified and we see it a bit more uh, clearly with the strain rates. The phase, however, is not changed, only the amplitudes of the signal. So this is just a side note about uh, dust and, and what we measure that is different from what seismometers measure. And now to compare observations on the left with simulations on the right. So with the PSD, we were able to at least qualitatively reproduce the frequency increases at the edges of the basin, both edges. In the middle of the basin, it's not so clear. We can't really see the frequency increases, but because we see them for the autocorrelations, as we can see here, we know that they do exist here. Reflections from the edges of the basin are reproduced with the same velocities as uh, of, the sim of the observations. And the same goes for the first five seconds of the simulations. We see the reflections from the edges of the basin and this triangular shape. Um, it's more evident for the autocorrelation, but also seen for the direct arrival. So to conclude the first part, we use resonating short waves um, in an underwater basin, first of all, to do ambient noise tomography, which is a classical method. We also used PSD and AC calculations to gain better understanding of wave propagation inside the basin. <clears throat> we were able to understand what's the shape of the basin, identify the velocity contrast, the low velocity zone. And we saw that we were able to use simulations as a tool to further modify the velocity model and validate it against uh, observations. Now, the low velocity zone in the middle of the basin, because we don't have any ground truth, we don't know if it's a fracture zone or a filled underwater channel, but we do know that it's some manifestation of a low velocity zone in the middle of the basin. So for the second part, uh, which will be much shorter, I'm going to show you initial results of how we can harness DAS for our early warning. The main principle of early warning is that if we place sensors close to expected earthquake epicenters, namely close to uh, active faults, we will be able to record the seismic signal as early as possible, analyze it, quantify the size and the damage potential of the earthquake, and then issue alerts to further population centers or infrastructures that need to uh, perform some mitigation actions a few seconds before the seismic waves arrive. The basic procedures to, to give early warning, first of all, we need to detect an earthquake. We need to say that this is an earthquake and not some random noise source. We need to locate the earthquake. We need to estimate its size, the magnitude, some systems also uh, estimate the stress drop. And finally, we need to provide ground motion predictions. Now for population centers, for the, for the users, let's say, the first three don't, are not really interesting. The only interesting thing is to have a reliable ground motion prediction, to have reliable prediction of the intensity of the ground shaking, whether we need to take mitigation actions or not. Now, the classic um, early warning system uses seismometers, and this comes with uh, several very significant limitations. These systems require that at least four detections of the earthquake happen at four different stations to issue warning, to, to assert that it is an earthquake and not some random noise source. And this is specifically problematic in urban environments where we have a um, lot of noise sources. And when the network is sparse, if we have to wait four seconds, sorry, if we have to wait for the fourth station, we may have to wait uh, many seconds if the fourth station is very far from the epicenter. Another problem that we have is because of the edge of the network. If we have an earthquake offshore, and this is an example from the Tohoki earthquake, we have to wait until the seismic waves arrive to the first on-land stations. And with the Tohoki, um, if we would have ocean bottom sensors, they could have spared around 20 seconds. So these are 20 seconds that could have been used for mitigation actions 
but we didn't know that an earthquake occurred because the waves didn't arrive to shore yet. And we also have a location ambiguity. If we have sensors that are in a line, we cannot accurately say if the earthquake is located on this side of the line or on this side. Another problem is telemetry delays. Because we use different sensors, we need communication to the different sensors. Sometimes the information from the sensors can come in late and sometimes it cannot come at all if the station is offline or something is wrong with the communication. Uh, the last problem that I can think of, we have an issue with finally finite faults. If we have a very large earthquake, the fault is not a point source, it extends to some length and then the ground motions um, are also emitted from other sections of the fault. So again, the Tohoku earthquake started here, but the rupture progressed to the south. Strong ground shaking were also emitted from this section of the, um, of the rupture, but no warning was issued to this region of Japan because the system assumed that it was a point source. So it, it did two things. It underestimated the magnitude and it underestimated the ground motions because it assumed that all ground motions are emitted from this point. And these are all things that we can uh, resolve if we use DAS for early warning. Now in Japan, instead of using DAS, they installed a very expensive ocean bottom seismometer network um, that significantly shortened the time that it takes to detect an earthquake that occurs on the trench and issue alerts to um, the population of Japan. But again, this is something very expensive and cannot be applied anywhere around the world. A lower cost solution is to use DAS. So the advantages of DAS and the, the main reasons that it can work so well for early warning is that it can perform measurements in hard to reach places such as underwater or boreholes closer to the hypocenters of earthquakes. We do know that most of the largest earthquakes on earth occur underwater. So this will be very advantageous. We have continuous measurements in both time and space and continuous measurements in space will help us distinguish between earthquakes and noise. Earthquakes are seen on longer stretches of fiber, one, two kilometers and so and on, while noise can be seen on very limited fiber segments. Uh, we can obtain robust earthquake locations and this is something that has not been demonstrated yet because we need the, the aperture of the fiber be at the same order of magnitude as the distance between the fiber and the hypocenter. But I'm sure that when we get the right observations, this is something that can also be shown. Magnitude, the estimate of the source uh, size can be averaged over many stations, many virtual seismometers. Signal to noise can be enhanced because we can stack the different channels. We don't have telemetry delays because all the measurements are performed from one end of the fiber. And we may be able to address the issue of finite faults because we will be able to track the rupture in real time and estimate the size of larger earthquakes. <clears throat> We do have some obstacles and some limitations that we need to address. First of all, DAS measures strains, while magnitude requires ground motions. So we need to convert strain to ground motions in real time. We don't have enough seismic data. Uh, typically, early warning systems are constructed uh, using empirical data sets, very large Earth three data sets. Because DAS is a relatively new technology, we don't have enough earthquake records. So we'll have to take a theoretical approach to the problem. And DAS has high inherent noise levels. And this is something that I'm going to demonstrate in a few slides. So because we take a theoretical approach, let's talk about the physics of ground motions. The displacement is very strongly correlated with the seismic moment. We see a power of five over six, the velocity only a power of one half, and the acceleration has a power of one third. Now, most early warning systems use PD, the peak displacement in the first few seconds of the earthquake, as a predictor of magnitude because of this strong correlation. Whereas for velocity and accelerations, the um, correlation is not as strong and they do not constitute very good magnitude predictors. Another issue, if you want to be able to uh, estimate the size of the very large earthquakes, we need to avoid magnitude saturation and we need to see very low frequencies. This is an example of uh, the spectra, the far field spectra for different earthquakes as a function of frequency. Different magnitude scales saturate 
a different magnitudes because of the uh, limited frequency content. If we want to be able to estimate the magnitude of the very large earthquakes, we need to go to very low frequencies, 0.01 Hertz, maybe even lower. Now, the problem that we have with instrumental noise affects the two problems that I just talked about. We would want to estimate the magnitude using displacement. And displacement can be obtained if we convert the integral of strain. But when we look at the integral of strain, the low frequency noise, the instrumental dust noise, increases as f to the power of minus two. So if we would try to use displacement, we would mostly see the instrumental noise. We cannot really use this seismic signal to estimate the magnitude, even though the correlation with the seismic moment is the strongest. When we look at the velocities, which are proportional to strain, we are again dominated by low frequency noise, as we can see here. The low frequency noise um, decreases as f to the minus one. So again, we cannot use velocity, even though the power is not so bad, only a power of f. We can, however, use accelerations. The strain rate is proportional to ground accelerations. Low frequency noise is not a problem. We can go down to low frequencies. The instrumental noise is flat. However, um, PGA or accelerations are proportional to the seismic moment by a power of one third. So not a very good correlation, but that's the best we can do with, uh, with the current measurements. Another problem, small one, we need to low pass filter the strain rate data because we have high frequency noise introduced by the, by the interrogator. But this is not an issue because high frequency noise or high frequencies do not cause magnitude saturation. I'm going to briefly go over the theoretical derivation, um, not going too much into the detail. We use the Brune omega square model for accelerations subject to high frequency attenuation and some low pass filter. We can see the model here in green. We derived an expression for the acceleration RMS using the theoretical model. And the reason that it's uh, very easy to work with RMS is because we can work both in the time and frequency domain owing to Parseval's theorem. We can derive the model in the frequency domain using a frequency domain representation and then calculate RMS directly from the seismogram in the time domain. We come up with a fairly simple expression for the seismic moment that is a function of X, A, B, and C. They are themselves uh, functions of different parameters. But in real time, the only thing that changes is the acceleration RMS that we measure from the seismogram, the time window that starts from two seconds. It can be two, three, four, five, how many seconds we have uh, of dust strain rate signals, and the hypocentral distance, which changes because we estimate the location in real time and the location changes, the distance changes. I'm not going to go into that because we don't have much time, but the main approach of the basic algorithm for each dust channel in a short, well-coupled fiber segment, we apply a low pass filter to get rid of the high frequency noise. We apply a slant stack approach to determine the parent velocity using limited fiber segments. We then smooth the slowness time series and convert strain rate to acceleration. So this is the equation. We have a strain rate time series. We get a slowness time series from the slant stack approach. We divide them one by the other and get acceleration time series. And then we apply an additional low pass filter to get rid of artifacts that this process creates. If we have um, fast variations of the velocity, we can introduce high frequencies and we would want to again filter those out. Then we calculate the RMS for each channel in this short segment. We average the ARMS for each segment. Then we estimate the seismic moment and we can predict PGA, PGV, uh, P grand accelerations, P grand velocities to further location. And this is, used, this is done using ground motion prediction equations or GMPs uh, that were derived from the same theoretical model as the magnitude estimation. Um, a few parameters that go into the equation. The interesting thing here is that the distance in this case is taken from the Earth-Week catalog. This is a problem that I did not address in this study. 
the t is the time available uh, in real time. And ARMS is measured directly from the time series. As time progresses, we record more seismic signal, t increases, and ARMS uh, also changes. These are initial results because I'm not showing you the full data set. We intend to include some of the data recorded by uh, the experiment in Chile. So now we are limited to uh, small earthquakes at um, long hypocentral distances up to 170 kilometers. And these are the results. What I'm showing here are real-time magnitude as a function of catalog magnitude. But this is not the interesting panel because what we're eventually interested in is how well we can predict peak ground shaking. So in these two panels, we're showing the residuals for PGA at the top and PGV at the bottom. So we have log PGA predicted using GMPs, using GMPs and the real-time magnitude estimate, minus log PGA observed. And this is observed at seismic stations on land that are uh, further away from the um, dust fiber. Being above the line means we are overestimating big ground motions. Below the line, we are underestimating. Different colors for different earthquakes. We have the magnitudes and distances listed here and the number of, uh, of seismometers, the number of uh, pig ground observations. So I'm going to move forward in time, going from two seconds to four seconds, we see an improvement because the magnitude also updates. At six seconds, seven, at 10 seconds, we already see a very good agreement between PGA and PGV, the predictions in real time and the observations. Um, and again, these are only initial results. I'm going to add more data and make this validation more meaningful. But already we have data from different regions, data from uh, Greece and data from France, adding another data set from a different tectonic environment would uh, further strengthen the validity of this approach. So to conclude, um, I drive theoretical magnitude estimation, ground motion predictions, both rely on the omega square model. And because these are um, derived from the same model, they are self-consistent and geographically independent. We didn't have to fine tune any parameter here, any velocity or attenuation parameter or a stress drop. Um, it, it worked for the entire data set regardless of the parameter that we inserted into the model. We don't have magnitude saturation, which is very good. We don't have a way of testing that because we don't have a large earthquake records using dust yet. But the advantage of this uh, approach, this theoretical approach, is that it allows for continuous update of magnitude and ground motions, while most uh, early warning systems only use the first three or four seconds to estimate the magnitude, and then they stop. So with this theoretical approach, we can continue uh, updating our estimates. And this is very useful if we have uh, very long ruptures that take few seconds to tens of seconds to develop. Um, okay, thank you. I'll be happy to take questions.